mean, I served a mission in Czechoslovakia right after the wall came down. Mm -hmm. My companion and I were the first sisters to go in there. And we saw what happens, uh, kind of that degradation in society. It is not just economic destruction that you have when you have uh, one narrative and centralized control, right? It is economic. It is the social fabric tearing apart. It is family relationships that are massively damaged because everyone's afraid everyone else is going to turn them into the government, even their own children. It is so destructive of absolutely everything. And now um, I don't remember why I went here because you had said something a minute ago. Uh, well, well we the didn't... electorate, like being able to admit oh, yeah. we were wrong. and Yeah. Like I just think that one narrative driving everything, again, this goes back to asking questions. Yeah. We have – so I would ask people when I was there, like, did you guys believe Pravda? Because, you know, the Russians had one news source, mm -hmm. and that was the information that went out to all of the Soviet republics as well as Russia itself, right? right? Like, did you believe this? No, nah, we, we didn't believe it. Now, certainly, I guarantee there were quite a few people who did, but I never met anyone who actually admitted to having believed it. But I look around in our society today, and I'm deeply disturbed at how many people – don't read or consume news from various types of sources. Mm -hmm. I am a hardcore conservative because I've spent my spent my life talking to people and reading what the other side has to say. Yeah. And that's the only way that we can get to the truth. If yeah. we are not willing to expose ourselves, and I don't I don't mean people have to every single day, but if you haven't at least arrived at your fundamental conclusions by understanding why some people think differently and then understanding that, yeah, what you believe is is different. It's based on facts and theirs might be based on emotion or feeling, which mm -hmm. I think is often the case, mm -hmm. right? Um, or an acceptance of what your end goal ultimately is and theirs is something different. I mean, mine always comes back to the Constitution because the Constitution is the only thing that can protect us and, and it's losing this power because we're electing people who don't respect it. But it is the only thing that protects us from government force. Mm -hmm. Yet we have people who think the government's awful saying tear down the Constitution. They don't know what it is. Yeah. It's the only thing that keeps you from abuse by the powerful. Right. Why would you want it gone? Right? right. But all of this, it is, I just think we're lost. First of all, I think it's an education issue with our schools, but, and, and the federal government controlling too much of what we're being taught and our mm. kids are being taught in, in public schools. But also just this whole, an overarching narrative that some people have trouble seeing beyond is, it's just dangerous. It's damaging to society altogether. Yeah. And I think that's why there's this effort to shut down free speech in order to grow the narrative so that more people will be lost and confused. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, um, it reminds me of the story of the Tower of Babel. It really does. Yep. And it sounds, um, if you're not Christian or if you don't know the story of the Tower of Babel, this will not make any sense to you whatsoever. <laughs> but confusing confusing, mm -hmm. and uh, breaking down communication, right? Mm -hmm. Just mixing up yep. somebody's words and doing that in an instant and uh, uh, across uh, uh, an entire populace, the chaos that ensues. Right. So thinking of the 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 falling of the wall, the USSR changing. And this is I just listened to the entire Putin uh, Tucker Carlson interview. Oh, I haven't listened. Oh, to that. my gosh. It was it for me because I, I took a, a China politics, uh, uh, Russia, China politics class specifically when I was an undergrad at Cal State Fullerton. And it was so much of like, you know, what he had talked about was flooding back to like my understanding and, and watching this happen in early, you know, 2009 would have been when I took that class. And it, it was just fascinating because to your point, we have this narrative that a single, a, a single regime gets to dictate to their entire population over decades and decades and decades. Yeah. And they can actually rewrite history in, yes. it, at, at will, right? They can rewrite their own history at will. And so when you have this fall and you have this mass, basically this this uh, collapse of 
what is truth, what is this person saying, and you you can't communicate clearly, yeah. it causes massive chaos. Yeah. And and we're kind of going through that here in, in the United States, but it's it's a global communication breakdown, which is just so crazy because technology, you think we got better I at this. Know. Google Translate lets me talk in a, another <laughs> language so easy now, but we still can't get it right. Yeah. And I, it's just, it's fascinating to me. And, and all these problems, when you think about them from existentially, they're, it's almost like, what do you do? Like, what, how, how, do, how does one person or how does, how does one, one group make massive change? And, and the reality in my mind is we have to make small changes one yes. step at a time. And, and keep, keep fighting the good fight, right? It's just the, we don't, we can't give up hope. We got to keep driving. Uh, the rebel force wasn't always the rebel force, right? They were the, the rulers at one point and then, you know, things change and we're going through that right now. So, um, bringing that to foreign policy. So let's get back to you're, you're running for the U S Senate. Yeah. So you're going to the federal level and what that means for the state of Utah, um, is a lot, but when it comes to foreign policy, what do you think needs to change? Um, Mitt Romney uh, voted for additional uh, funds just the other day to go towards Ukraine and Israel. How would you have voted um, over the last $140 billion that we've sent over to Ukraine? Yeah. Like may maybe help me understand how you would have done that differently. Yeah. Do you know the average age of a soldier in Ukraine right now? I'm guessing it's like 18, but I don't know. It's like 52. Oh my goodness. I we did have the exact decimated opposite. their entire male population. Yeah. That, and that is us. Yeah. Because my understanding is that there were two opportunities early on in this war where Ukraine and Russia were ready to come to the table and settle. And we interrupted that. So that's strange. Mm -hmm. I got to say. We are wiping out their male population, we are wiping out our ability to defend our nation. There are some weapon systems that we are seven years behind in production, and we have nothing on the ground, and we've sent it to Ukraine. And everyone knows that that's a losing war. Mm. And again, what are we doing to the population of that country? And what is the end game for us? Do you know that early on in this war, I've asked friends of mine who have supported this funding. Early on, I've said, okay, you support us backing up Ukraine in this war. Tell me what your goal is. It was always to restore the border. Do you know what Biden said the ultimate goal of this fight against Russia was? Do you even know? I think it's R Russia surrendering, right? Regime change. Yeah. yeah. We literally, yeah. we literally said regime change openly. Yeah. I do not know a single He says a soul. lot of things. He I says know. a lot of things. But that was his administration's yeah. stated policy. And when you say it, especially going back to listening to what Putin said, he's like, he believes. You say this thing, that's what he believes. Even, you know, he, he multiple, uh, multiple times he talked about how we have signatures on the Minsk agreements between Ukraine and yes. Russia. He's like, they signed saying that they agreed to it. And then day, weeks later, they said the exact opposite and that there was nothing they agreed to. And he's like, you, your words are the only thing that matter then. Like you can sign yeah. papers all day long, but what you say is what I have to operate and run my country yep. Yep. based off of what you say. And I can't argue with him on that. Because if we, if we say one thing or we, we write down on a piece of paper, we're going to do one thing, but we say something else, people are going to take you for your word. That's yep. what, I mean, in my mind. But, yeah. No, I'm going to have to listen to that. But also, do you remember too, we were told, Russia said, uh, if I remember correctly, I, I swear they came out and said it, or at least, or I heard this from some source that I trusted early on, that Russia had said that if we stopped pushing NATO mm -hmm. with Ukraine, that they would back off. Mm -hmm. They felt threatened, and we never should have done that. But again, I, I don't know. It it's seems, a little Monday morning quarterback, right? Yeah, but it seems as though – no, but a lot of people were saying that at the time. Stop True, yeah. trying to pull them into NATO because they'd agreed. We were putting pressure on uh, Ukraine to enter NATO, mm -hmm. and then Russia would have been surrounded by NATO. Now, right. explain to me why we even have NATO. Right. Because NATO was to push back against a so a, an expanding Soviet empire. Right. That empire fell apart, you know, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Why do we have NATO? 
mm-hmm. by the way. Why, and why are we funding it? I think it's time for Europe to step up if they believe that that is a, a threat that they need to guard against. Mm-hmm. I don't think that Russia is a good player, right? Right. Right? It's not our job. Mm-hmm. They have not been an expanding force for decades. Yeah. So anyway, so that's even another discussion, right? Uh, so we've decimated their male population. We've greatly hurt our own ability to defend our own country and one of the absolute most important fundamental duties of our federal government is to protect this nation. Right. I don't think we would be able to do that if we needed to right now. Just southern border is the perfect example. Well, going back to what you said about A, B, and C being true and then we wanting wanting F, it's almost like – we're, we're using the justification for, well, if we don't do this in Ukraine, we can't protect our borders, right? It's like the, it's that logical yeah. fallacy jump that yeah. we're, we're making. It's no, crazy. It, it's absolutely silly. That bill was a joke, and I could run down a number of things that were a problem. Do you know what the scariest thing is that I don't hear anyone talking about? So most of us realize that the um, executive branch has taken a whole bunch of – powers from the legislative branch and the legislative branch has acquiesced, right? Yeah. We have all these agencies that essentially make law. Mm-hmm. It can, their, their regulations can strip us of life, liberty, and property. Right. And they are not elected officials and that is not how we're constitutionally established. Right. But it has happened for decades. We've allowed it. The legislative branch has allowed it. So I was unaware of this until the language for that bill came out on Sunday, I think. And I came across something that said, so currently when Illegal aliens enter the country. They, they, this has been going on for about a, at least a decade. I've been aware of it or a little more that they should declare asylum, right? Because if they declare asylum, my understanding from some federal officials recently is that the executive branch is to hold them until the adjudication of their case. We don't do that. Right. Um, we had the Remain in Mexico policy under Trump, but Biden got rid of that. And now these people are not held. Probably up to 10 million illegal aliens over the past three and a half years have come into our country and they are all over the place. And they, uh, many of them, if they've claimed asylum, they've been given papers as to when they need to show up in court, right? So judges adjudicate those cases. Most of those cases do not qualify for asylum. So they need to be deported. We never deport. Okay, here's the ICE is not allowed to deport them either. Additionally, so so really? this, so from what I understood, this and this is from an ICE, this is from an ICE agent under Obama. They uh, eliminated the ability for ICE to deport them. They couldn't do it. Trump came into office. They were allowed to deport them. Oh. The minute Biden took office, they took the ability. The ICE could not deport them. They were not allowed to. It was official. It was like the policy that they were not allowed to deport them. Okay, I didn't even know that. Yeah, it's wild. That's horrific. It's wild. It now make get sense. this. Now get this. Now we have, so in the language of the bill, it says, it codifies an executive order that Biden had put out. I think it was in 2022. I was totally unaware of it. I'd never heard of it before until this bill language was released. And people were saying, oh, it'll codify that awful executive order. That executive order takes judicial power and puts it in the executive branch. Do you know what it's called when all government power is housed in one branch yeah there's a word for that Ty- tyranny right yeah that is tyranny tyranny that's that that's probably tyranny. the nicest word you could come up with yeah, yeah.